իրավական շապատ։ Military operations in Artsakh. Peaceful civilians suffered from the Azerbaijani aggression. Azerbaijan has violated the standards of international humanitarian law. Experts talk about the current situation, its repercussions and solutions. 40-year-old Kayane tells how her elderly parents were brutally murdered by Azeri soldiers. On April 2nd, the Defense Army of Nagorno-Karabakh announced that Azerbaijan had resumed military operations along almost the entire front line. Azerbaijani military force used a wide range of weapons, such as helicopters, drones and artillery, including tanks. The operations continued until April 4th. As a result, soldiers died, a child perished, peaceful civilians suffered and houses were ruined. The team from the Armenian Lawyers Association has been to Artsakh. Iravabandet journalist Gevork Tosunyans and cameraman Alexander Sarkisyan's special reports from the hot spots of Karabakh. When you hear a loud sound like thunder in a sky without clouds, you should immediately lie down and open your mouth so that your eardrums don't explode and pray. This rule is known to each inhabitant of Masakhet. Have you watched action movies where the actors stand up after a shell explosion in a bombarded area and start shooting? The reality is different. When a shell is dropped, an area of 10 to 20 meters in diameter is destroyed. A small shell fragment can kill a person and the wave of explosion can make walls collapse. Symphony of machine guns. That's how the inhabitants of Martaged describe the shots heard in their town every night. It has become usual. They shoot non-stop and they hear the symphony every day. The Azeris are just three kilometers away. On the days preceding the April bombings, drones had been unusually active here. Whoever had a weapon tried to shoot these machines. And it is not surprising that spent bullets can be seen in every street of Martaged. People know that the falling shell doesn't care whether you are a soldier, a peaceful civilian or an animal grazing in the pasture. It came, fell and broke up. It is over here and over there as well. In three, four fields, they shoot a lot here. The blast of machine guns fire and heard here very well. There hasn't been a time in these past one, two years when we didn't hear the symphony of machine guns. Those small caliber weapons operate all the time, which is why it was nothing unusual for the citizens. We didn't think that such large-scale operations would follow, but this is different. This is war. Let alone the fact that drones kept hovering in this territory. The kids could see it well. They said, look, it comes again, it's really come. They kept turning around and taking photos and videos. The headmistress of the school named after Vladimir Bayan hurried to the school armed with pliers to remove the broken fragments of glass from the windows. This educational institution was significantly damaged during the shooting. Window panes were broken and the walls of the building, which already were in bad condition, collapsed in some places. The school has 620 pupils and 50 teachers. The pupils left the school in a hurry, and one of them left the textbook of Armenian history on the desk. We wanted to cover the windows with cellophane when a shell was dropped. An explosion followed, the cloud of dust rose to the sky, and we remained on the floor. If it's a war, then we shall fight. But if it's not, then let us live in peace, angrily said Boric Stepanyan, citizen of Martaget. One of the shells that were dropped on the city ruined the roof of his neighbor's house and broke the windows. There was an explosion which damaged my car. We were already inside the car. It hit the panels. There was debris. I have small children. I took them and left. More than a dozen houses were ruined during the bombings in Martaked. On April 3rd, Haik's grandfather was not at home when the Azeris bombarded the town. The footage made on the spot will present what happened here better. This one fragment of an Azeri shell can kill any citizen who happens to appear in the territory. On April 3rd, hundreds of fragments were flying around here. The Balayan's house was damaged the most. This happened on the 3rd in the afternoon, at about 12. The house collapsed from the shell explosion. My grandfather had gone to buy bread. When he came back, it was already like this. The shell fell here. It flew over the house and hit here. That wall collapsed from the blow too. This used to be the kitchen. Everything was smashed and collapsed. We are going to the southeastern region of Artsakh. In spite of the present danger and unpredictable situations, surprises like this are awaiting us on the road.
Even on these days, people of Artsakh live their normal lives, which includes animal husbandry, agriculture and trade. 25-year-old Karen herds his family's flock only two kilometers away from the adversary. You're not planning to leave? No, I will stay here. If I leave my land, where would I go? A Smirch missile was dropped not far from Karen's home. It is not permitted to use such weapons against peaceful citizens. We see Grad and Smirch missiles on our way to the front line. The military says that Azeris use this weapon not only against the army, but also peaceful citizens. Our side didn't start the war. During the military actions, it was the Azeris who started bombing the army units, thus manifesting clearly aggressive acts. We were driving up to bring my friend's car down. My friend's car was over there. Mine had got to here. We were about 30 meters from our destination. They shot at once. It hit my friend's car. We got out to escape and they shot our car. We managed to survive. It didn't hit us. On the way back to Stepanakert. Two children who were seriously injured near the Marsuni school on April the 2nd are treated in Arabic Children's Medical Center. On that day, 12-year-old Farinak Grigoyan died as a result of grad fire. It had already exploded. I fell down and almost didn't feel any pain. Vatan likes sports. He won't be able to do his favorite sport for a long time to come. Lying in bed next to him was the brother of the deceased Farinak. Because of the pain from his wounds, he was not able to speak. The Azerbaijani aggression is also a serious breach of international humanitarian law, according to experts. On a mission to protect the rights of the citizens of Nagorno-Karabakh, the Armenian Lawyers Association, together with a team from Iravabanet, a news website operated by the association, sent a delegation to Nagorno-Karabakh. Headed by Artak Saribekyan, the executive director of the association, the delegation undertook a fact-finding mission in Nagorno-Karabakh. The following report gives the details. Human rights are of the utmost value and must be upheld, regardless of the military situation. Guided by this principle, the Armenian Lawyers Association went to Artsakh to the heat of the military action. Our primary goal was to undertake a fact-finding mission. We went to the areas and villages where peaceful civilians had suffered as a result of military operations. This mission will be followed by a report on the situation, which will include recommendations concerning the protection of human rights and concrete actions. Now, why is this important not only for our organization, but also for the entire community of civil society organizations? The reason is a very simple one. These are the very moments when the community of civil society organizations needs to stand in solidarity with the peaceful population, protecting the rights of the citizens who suffered as a result of military actions. Larissa Alevedian, who is Armenia's first human rights defender, shares these beliefs. She is confident that the whole civil society sector must unite in the face of this situation. For me, the context is the dynamics of regional security that keeps getting worse with every passing day. The context is always important to me. We should not focus only on the fact that the Turks have yet again committed atrocities against us. We need to show that this is a new episode that is directed against the civilized world in general and the region in particular. And this new episode promises to be long-lasting. No one can tell whether the short-term ceasefire will do more than an open-ended agreement. Ms. Alavedian also went to Artsakh with the aim of supporting and providing legal assistance for the civilians who had suffered. She says that the actions of Azerbaijan are in direct contrast to the standards that have been employed by the civilized world for dozens of years. Furthermore, there are two cases when the goal was to inspire terror among Armenian society. One of them is what happened with the Halafian family, who lived in Talish village, in the Martakert region. The oldest member of this family was a 92-year-old woman. They didn't just kill them, they cut off their ears. There is such a tradition in cannibal tribes, when they must bring evidence to prove that they have murdered a person. The second case is what happened with the Yazidi boy, who, as far as we know, was beheaded. Nagorno-Karabakh Republic human rights defender Yuri Hayrapetyan 
notes that Azerbaijan continues violating the norms of international humanitarian law. To be more specific, it has violated the four treaties of the Geneva Conventions, which set out rules concerning the conduct of military operations. It is clearly specified there that military action must not be directed against civilian populations, but it was in this case, even though it is clearly specified that civilians should not suffer. According to him, citizens who have suffered should apply to the human rights defender so that the latter can support them in appealing to the European Court of Human Rights. It's our duty to support these people, to make sure that their applications are correctly formulated. They collect the evidence that will be needed in court and that the evidence is recorded. Nagorno-Karabakh Republic Member of Parliament Haik Khanumyan says that during the April clashes, Azerbaijan used extremists, including Islamist militants, involved in the Syria conflict. Obviously, calling on corresponding agencies plays an important role in this context, but I am not so inclined to believe in the practical possibility of holding Azerbaijan accountable under international law. I believe that successful actions of the Defense Army are the only guarantee to prevent recurrence of such events. The murder committed by the Azeri soldiers in the night on April 2nd was dreadful. Violating the ceasefire, they entered the village of Talish and killed three elderly and helpless persons. They cut off limbs and defiled the bodies. Guyana, the daughter of the killed Halapians, tells how the incident happened and how her family survived. Details in Asri Karapetian's report. <laughs> They went there, entered the house and saw everyone already killed. My grandmother was 92 years old and was at her deathbed. My father was sick as well and that was why my mother had also remained there. She said she would wait. Soon they would come and take them. My father was killed sitting in the armchair. My mother was on the floor. I saw it on TV. 40-year-old Gaana Nazuns is the daughter of Valera and Razmela Halapians, who were killed brutally in Talish. There were 11 in the family. 92-year-old grandmother, 65-year-old Valera, his 60-year-old wife, their son, daughter-in-law, and their six children. Their baby is six months old. The eldest is 13 years old. When the shooting started in the night, he managed to take his wife and six children out of the village in his car and bring to Derembon village. He returned to take his parents, but was not allowed to enter the village because of the shooting. At night, we again heard noise. We got up and saw that they were shooting again. The house was quaking. We got out and went into the cellar, hid under the tables and beds to wait till dawn when we would be able to get out. When we felt they had stopped, my brother said he had already taken the children out. He told us to get out. We asked, and what if they shoot? He said, but in any case, the Turks are in the village. Guyana says that her family survived thanks to her brother. If her brother had warned them a couple of minutes later that the Azeris had entered the village, maybe none of them would be alive. No, it's good that we didn't see them, otherwise we would not survive. You should have heard the kids' cries. We were lying on the ground, our faces in the ground. There was so much soil in my mouth. We had entered the bathroom when they shot. They hit the mirror. It broke and the pieces were all over the cellar. 85-year-old Nora Nazunt has seen the war of the 90s, but... This year. It was not so then. This is like the world war. In those days, we left on food. This time, we weren't able to. They were shooting and shooting after us. The Lord had mercy upon the children. We somehow got to Martakert and so they were bombing here as well. Were we told that there is a war going on? No, they didn't announce anything. At 3.30 a.m. they started shooting from all directions. I was asleep. One of the kids came crying, Granny, Granny, wake up! I can't hear well. I grabbed my clothes but couldn't go down. My son helped me. We went downstairs to the basement. There was smoke everywhere. They were shooting. The kids were scared. I kept telling them, don't be afraid, don't be afraid. 
Everybody found a small corner to hide. We thought we had no chance. My son came saying, we are getting out. I said, they are shooting, what can we do? Whatever happens, happens. The woman says that in 1992, Azeris had burned down their house, but they came back and rebuilt it with great difficulty. They were one of the well-off families in Talish. They had about 50 cows, 20 sheep and other domestic animals. Now they have no information about their property. We had sheep, we had cows and calves, we left them inside. Couldn't open the door and free the calf so that it could join his mother, drink her milk and survive. They were shooting. So I think it might be dead now. Thank God we had everything. We were doing okay. And now... The family has fled its native village, leaving everything behind. It's painful for Guyana to describe how difficult it was to remove her parents' bodies. It's also hard for her to say that she won't be able to go to the funeral.